Well, good morning, and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church, where our mission is to glorify God and make disciples for Jesus Christ. And it is truly amazing to see that multiple generations here up on the stage. I was just amazed as I saw Mark and Steve and then Zach on the stage. And that's what our hope and desire is to build up and train up that next generation to spread the news of Jesus Christ. That is our hope and that is our goal. And one of the things as I've been going through this passage, I've been thinking about this week, as I think about everything that's going on in the world, a lot of times me and that spend our times in prayer. Um, every morning, or at least we try to do every morning, we read the devotions and we pray. And after we get done praying for our family, we pray for you. We pray for new hope. We pray for this church. We pray for the families, for God to strengthen families. We pray for those who are weak, because we know that it's only by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit working in your lives that will transform you, encourage you, gird you, and prepare you for all life testing. Because we live in a world that is testing us and trying us, and, and we need to be transformed. Now, the world is going to tell you how they want you to be transformed. As, as the latest one is being transformed from a man become a girl and a, and a girl become a man, whatever that's about, the world's going to say, we want to transform you into our image. Uh, it's one of the few reasons why m me and that have decided we're not going to ever send Joshua to public school because we just don't like what the public school might transform it into. We want to mold Joshua into the image of God's word and our character and not the world. The world is going to, transform, going to try to transform you into its image. And that is one reason, as we've been talking about this, we've been talking about the series of this, and Peter's whole point in this message, is to defend the faith. Peter is writing this letter to these believers in Asia Minor that are going to face these challenges of those false teachers that are going to invade the church and try to mislead them. Instead of transforming them into the image of Christ, they're going to transform into the image of these false teachers. And so he's preparing them. And so we must be on our guard, prepared for these people. Now, this idea of being transformed, there's nothing more compelling. In this world right now, people want change in their life. Don't you want change in your life? Don't you wish that you were not the same as you were yesterday and then you are today and tomorrow, that we, we hope we can be different and change? And you know, for some of us, we like to wake up one morning and maybe be maybe a little younger, or maybe we'll wake up a little bit, uh, a little healthier, and maybe the bones ache a little less. And, and in, the, in the book of Romans, it talks about how being transformed by the renewing your mind, this word transform is this word as metamorpho, which is where we get the idea of metamorphosis. We want to get a bit transformed, and I always like this image of uh, metamorphosis because you think of uh, a caterpillar. I don't know. Did you guys ever read your kids, The Hungry Caterpillar? And I've read it to Joshua over and over and over. But the, it's a great illustration of transformation. What it looks like is you got this little caterpillar and it eats more and eats more and eats more and eventually finds a leaf and it, it hangs on this leaf and it builds this chrysalis around itself. And, and what a lot of people don't know and, and didn't learn until recently that if we were to cut that chrysalis in half before it's fully formed, all you would see in there is mostly just goo because when it's in that chrysalis, it is completely radically transformed. It breaks down its body completely down and is rebuilt up into this new creature that has wings and these antennae and, and it can fly and it's brilliant, beautiful color. It goes from this caterpillar that you're like, I don't really like the look of that to this beautiful caterpillar. And that's the kind of transformation, that metamorphosis we want to see in our lives to be transformed. And so one of the questions is how do we get that transformation? How do we have a transformation that looks like Christ versus a transformation of the world? Because the world is 
trying. I, I always, I've been saying this recently is there are competing transformations going on. The world is going to try and transform you into its image. And, and there's, everyone is teaching a doctrine. Everyone's trying to indoctrinate it to you. I mean, that's half of what news and television and media is. That's part of the reason why uh, teenagers need to be careful with social media. If you look at the studies of the effect of social media, it's huge because it is transforming how the youth think. It's transforming them into the image of what the social media person wants to create. And, and so I, I, I was telling the youth a night ago, don't get social media. You shouldn't be on social media. It's a dangerous place. Even as an adult, as I look at some of the stuff on there, I'm like, yikes. Um, in fact, there's one social media account, I just completely d delete it because this is not good. And it can have a corrupt influence. You've got to be careful of what is trying to transform you. Is it God's word or is it the world? And then that's part of what this text is talking about, is being transformed by God's word and not being transformed by the lusts of the world. And so we're going to look at this passage about being transformed life from 2 Peter 1, 3 through 7. And we're going to look at three things. First is the transformed power. What will give you the power and the ability to be transformed in the image of God? Where do I find that? I, I don't feel like I can be transformed. I don't know how I get transformed in the image of God. So what gives me that power? Transform nature. Well, I don't want to be who I am. I don't want these, the desires I have, my wants. I, I know I want some different, but how do I go to this new nature that I'm struggling with. And the last of all, a transformed character. What is this transformed character that we would want in ourselves? How should my life look different? And so we're gonna look at these three things now. A transformed power, a transformed nature, a transformed character. And as we look at this, well, I, I, my goal and my hope is to see how God is gonna be working in you to transform you into the image of God. And what's the thing that we often struggle with is how does that happen? So let's, I want to, first, before we get started, I want to just do a quick review. Last week, we talked on first Peter, or second Peter, we talked about how through faith from God that we are redeemed and how God leads us to grace and peace and a knowledge of God, a personal relationship with God. That's what we talked about last week, about that initial moment. But then we move into this next part where we're talking about the transformation. So let's talk about the transforming power. The transforming power. So in verse 3, it says this. See that his divine power has been granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Notice here that the, not our power and it's not our ability that comes to transformation. But this is the biggest problem that as believers, we think we have to find it within ourselves. We got to pull ourselves by our own build traps. I have to clean up my life to make this transformation. But as we look at this test, we see it comes from God's divine power. God divine power is working in you. It's the power of Christ in you that he changes and molds you. And it, it, imagine... The God is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. That's divine power that's in you. But he uses this great word power, which is the Greek word dudamos, which is where we get the word dynamite. So you have this explosive power in your life. And you, you just think about a, a, a track star on the track star, and you shoot the gun, the guy just bolts forward and rushes to the fast line. That is, you can imagine, that is that energy and power being brought forth. And this is a power that you need to transform you. So therefore, it isn't by your strength. It is not by your ability. In fact, I would say if you were to re rely on your own ability and your own strength, and some of you probably have tried this. Some of you have probably tried to do this in your own effort. And you realize, why do I keep on failing? It's because you're trying to do it your own strength. And let me give you an illustration I just thought of. 
Imagine my son Joshua when he was first learning to walk, if he tried to learn to walk on his own strength and own ability. It would be difficult. But imagine if Joshua and what he did do relied on my strength and my power to help empower him to help him to learn to walk. It would, it would completely radically transform his ability to walk. In fact, the more Josh relies on me and Annette to help empower him to live his life, to learn how to read, how to walk, how to run, how to do all these things, the more he relies on us to empower him to do it. He can do amazing things. And the same thing is with us, that we need to rely on his strength and his ability to empower us to live a life. And so that's why prayer, and that as I started about prayer, is so important. When we go to God in prayer, we're like that little child going up to daddy saying, help, help daddy, I can't do it. And that's what we need, we need to go down for God, help me in this area, I'm struggling. Help me with my finances, help me with my lust, help me with my marriage. Lord, I can't do it on my own, I've done it, it doesn't work. Lord, help, give me the power. And when we go to God in power, and prayer, and in his power, and we just give it to all to him, you'll be amazed what God can do in your life. I mean, it's the only reason because of God's power that I'm on this stage. Lord knows that in high school, I would not be here. I'd be the exact opposite place. But it was only because of the dwelling power of the Holy Spirit in my life that I am here. And maybe some of you have experienced that, that it's only because God worked in your life that you are where you are today. And let me say, continue to go to God in prayer. Never stop, because only in there do you have the power. Now, one of the things I'd also notice uh, uh, is about some, uh, some people will doubt that God's power is enough. Have you ever felt like that? Like, you know, God may have the power to sanctify me or justify me, but he's done enough, have enough power to justify me. That's not what it says here. It, some of you may think, well, God has the power to justify and sanctify, but he can't glorify me. He can't keep me in my salvation. And it doesn't say here. Notice it says, uh, uh, his divine power has granted us everything. Said, his divine power has granted us everything to pray into life and godliness. I know it's in God, you have everything you need to live out a godly life. There's nothing when you accept Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I trust you in my life. I put your life in, my, in your hands. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. At that moment, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he gave you everything you need to live a godly life. You don't need a special blessing. You don't need another uh, a spiritual baptism, whatever. You already have everything you need to live a godly life. You have everything to be successful. In fact, he will continue to work in you. Uh, as Philippians 1.6 says, and Paul says, For I'm confident of this, that, the, that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That he's going to continue work in you and build you and transform you. So there's nothing that the power cannot do in your life. And how does God do it? It's through his sovereignty. And again, it's not through his ability. You notice know, it says, through the full knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by his glory and excellence. It's through his knowledge. It's through his ability. He knows you. You know, I love this Psalm 139, 16. It says, your eyes have seen my unshaped substance, and your books of them are written, the days that were formed for me, as yet they are, was not one of them. In other words, he has seen the book. Before you were born, he knew everything about your life. He knew when you'd be born, when you're going to die. He knew you're up and down. He knew the vac moment that you received Jesus as his Lord said. He knew exactly what it is. He knew the moments where you needed his encouragement. He knew the moments where you're going to be low and sad. He knew it all. And so he has the knowledge of you to know when you need him. There is nothing about your life. I know a lot of times we say we get cancer or we get sick or, 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 or we go to the hospital again or we, our house gets burned down and we think, where are you, God? And God says, I'm right here. God says, I'm right here, I'm with you. Nothing took him by his right. He knows what you need at the moment when you need it. All we gotta do is say is, God, help me get through this. 
and he will answer that prayer. He will give you the, 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 the things that you need for that moment. And, and he called you. Notice it says, he'll say, he called you. He is the one who called you. He is the one who elected you. He is the one predestined. He is the one who transformed you. He is going to bring you to his glory and his excellence. It's he who is the power to your transformation. And this is important because as believers, we forget this. We keep on thinking, no, I got to go back to my own strength and my own ability. And we wonder why we're so frustrated and struggle. Go back to the Lord in prayer and seek him for strength and ability. And he will answer you. God will always answer you in prayer. Now let's move on to transform nature. Verse 4 says, for by these he has granted us precision and magnificent promise that by them you may become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Beloved, here we see the covenant promise of God. The covenant promise of God that is the precision and valuable or magnificent and great. He, for in it, it is all the promises of God that you have been redeemed, that you are a child of God. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord said, so you are a son and daughter of God. That is your new nature. You're not, a, you're, you're not a person in this world. You are not a fallen nature. You have been redeemed. You were restored. You are now, as the New Testament author, a saint, sanctified, set apart from the things of this world. And it's through his power to transform you into a new person that in him as all the answers of promises are yes and amen that he has given you his peace he has given you his joy he's given you grace he has given you mercy he has completely transformed your nature and you are no longer the same person and it goes back to our illustration of the butterfly where you had a caterpillar and that was like our life before Christ. We were a cowboy that was on the ground, that was just scurrying around trying to get whatever we could eat. And then the moment of conversion when we're in the chrysalis, and then we come out a butterfly, God has completely transformed us that we do not look anything like we were before. And then we give another illustration I was thinking about this morning. The only other illustration I can think about in human sense is a man who before he goes in the army as this young teenage boy who knows nothing, and then he joins the army, he goes through boot camp and an individual training, and he comes out this soldier, this warrior, and who he is as a soldier is nothing like he was before. That in the military, he was transformed. He's no longer that young little boy anymore. Well, that is how your nature is transformed in Christ, that you come alongside God and you have a partaker of this divine nature. Now this doesn't mean that you are, now notice it says it talks about this divine nature and if you go to some Pentecostal circles, they'll say, oh, you, you have now become little gods. And let me say, no, you are not a little God. Let's be clear, you're not a little God. And you're not gonna do miracles like God. But God is working through you, through the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit comes alongside you, that, that, the divine nature to sanctify you, to make you and conform you to the image of Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone's in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old thing has passed away. Behold, the new things have come. And so now you have this new nature that your desires and your wants are no longer the things that you once desired. You know, it reminds you as, as you grow up, as a, when a little kid, what do you desire? You know, if I ask Josh, what does he want? Josh wants his pizza, he wants his mac and cheese and ice cream. And, and, and sometimes bread and cheese and that's it. And you're like, if it was me and I kept on eating that, I would get bored. Well, as you grow and grow and mature and adult, your desires change and they mature and you desire 
things that are good for you, like vegetables. I don't know about you, but I actually like vegetables now. And you, you want what's best for you. As a child, you just want to play games and you want to do stuff that, you know, would, would not, uh, are entertaining, but isn't necessarily the best thing for you. You want to just be, as a teenage boy, you just want to be lazy and do nothing. But God grows and matures you into a mature adult in Christ. And that's the image of what Christ is doing here. He's changing our nature and to make us a mature believer in Jesus Christ. And this is where I like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I don't have the verses up there, but I'll have it here. Jeremiah 31, 33. This should be a verse that we all should know. But this is a new covenant which I cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will bear, be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, that our hearts will be radically transformed, that God's laws and the desires of God will now be in us, that we don't need God's old, that we don't need the old covenant to change us and transform us because God will be living inside us. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, moreover, I'll give you a new heart. And in heart was another word for desire. He will give you a new desire and put a new spirit in you, a new life in you. And I will remove the heart of stone, the old sinful desire. He'll remove that and give you a heart of flesh that is tender, that is receptive to the words of God, that you will no longer desire the things of this world. And it's for this reason, beloved, that we need to be transformed because we need to escape the corrupt world by its lust. There is a lot of things in this world that's going to tear at you to your desires. In fact, it's more than ever, the, 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 the how we we put women and objectify them, or how we say, well, follow your desires and wants and, and, and cares. And we, we so much tantalize people. You need to look at the commercials. And you know the reason why they create beer commercials the way they do is they say, isn't that the lifestyle you want? Or you should go on these expensive vacations because don't you want to be that person? And, and they're trying to entice you. Now, not all of those things are bad. But the world is going to try to corrupt you into its image and its wants and its desires. And so we need to not be transformed into those lusts and those desires because they will transform. But we need to be transformed by God who will transform us from the inside out. That it is by his power. Now I want to say this. We are hopeless and addicted to sin like an alcoholic. But we are miraculously been made sober in Christ. I like that. I said we are hopelessly addicted to sin like all called, but we have been miraculously made sober by Christ. I've met people that have uh, that are they have received Christ at the last time was the last time they had a drink, the last time they ever smoked, or the last time they ever took a drug. That somehow by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, their nature was transformed, and these sinful desires that once attract them, that once took them has been radically transformed. I mean, I always talk to young people and I said, they asked me, so pastor, do you still, do you swear every once in a while? I said, no. I said, well, how's that possible? I said, I just don't. God worked into me and my friend Mark helped me. Good to have a good accountability partner, but worked into me where that's not even a temptation anymore. And, and that's what God will do. He will change you so those things that once tempted you will no longer, you will never, no longer be tempted by the lust of this world. Now let's talk about the transformed character real quick. And um, transformed character. And uh, we're going to look at verse 5 through 7. And we're going to try to go through this real quick. So uh, verse 5 says this. And now for the very reason also apply all the diligence in your faith, apply a moral excellence and your moral excellence knowledge. Now I'm going to stop there for a moment because we're going to slowly break this down in these next three verses. Now as we go through these verses, as we consider this, I want you to understand as he gives this list, he is giving a list of virtues that we should live out, but it is only out of by faith. You know, it says, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, is by faith that we live out these virtues. It's not something, remember we said we've been called, God's power is how we are transformed. Our nature has been transformed. And so these characteristics, as we look at these transformed characters, is a byproduct. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is what we should see. And as he describes this, he kind of describes a ladder of virtues. Um, or another way we could look at it is like a bookcase. And, and the two ones are an end. It's faith is on one side, love and on one side. And those books hold the whole virtue set together. But it also starts with faith is that beginning step. And you work your way to the ultimate, which is love, which is this agape love, which we'll get to this in a moment. This list of virtues is no different than what we see in Galatians 5, 22, 23. And, and Paul describes as love, joy, peace, patience, kind, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he gives this list for his audience well, Peter gets his list, and the interesting thing, as you look at Peter's list, it would have been the things that would have got the uh, Gentiles and Asia Meyer's attention. They were like, oh, that's interesting. And so he's appealing to his particular audience. Now, let, let's look at the first one. He says, uh, now we are here at contribute, uh, uh, contribute, or come alongside God by all diligence. Now, diligence is not a passive word. We, we, we are to, by all diligence, move towards this. Now, diligence is not passive. It is active. It is a striving. It is moving forward. It is an active word. You can almost think of a runner sprinting. You can think of Eric Lindell as he sprints to the finish line. Or if you saw the new Tom Cruise movie, which I did, he's always running his movie and he's running full speed. This kind of diligence is this active word of you are doing this with action, purpose, and means. So all diligence means do it purposely. And again, we are reminded that this is all based on faith, for he says, in your faith, supply moral excellence. So what is allowing it to happen is faith. Faith always comes first. Faith is over there. I actually had someone ask me earlier this week, say, well, wait a minute, is obedience and then faith? Is it faith by obedience? Says, no, faith always comes first, but faith is so close that faith always leads to obedience. Obedience does not always lead to faith, but faith always leads to obedience. And if your faith does not lead to obedience, then there's a question, what do you really believe in? What is your real faith in? And faith should always lead to obedience. And in the first set, it talks about this idea of moral excellence. Now, moral excellence is to have the courage to live a godly, moral, virtual life in both in thought and action. That you live a life that people look like, like wow, that guy has character. It reminds me of recently there was a, I'm not trying to get political here, it just came to my mind, my, that someone was asking Mike Pence a question. And he could use that moment to get angry, could have got frustrated, could have denounced Trump at that moment. But he, with his great moral excellence, explained to the person why they were wrong. And that's a kind of character. You want someone who has a character that would be moral excellent in all situations. They do the more right thing. Even when they can be tempted to do the wrong thing. It's very tempting when we see uh, someone might drop the $100 bill. Like, hey, I, I, they don't see it. I'll just take the $100 bill. You know, it's very easy to give in those temptations when, oh, maybe I won't put that in my taxes this year. And we want to have more excellent, even those areas that we think we can get away with, that we say, no, I want to live a moral, excellent life. And by the way, people notice it. People will notice your moral, excellent character. You know, one of the things that I, I, as people, um, not to put Trampus on the spot, everyone knows his excellent character. Everyone loves him in the community. I, I can name one person that says, Oh, no, Trampers is not good. No, they all say, ah, oh, he's so amazing. He's the best town manager we ever had. And then people can see his moral excellence. And that is what we want, people to see our moral excellence. However, with moral excellence should lead to knowledge. 
Knowledge of what? Knowledge of what God's word would say. Knowledge of discernment. Knowledge of God's character. Knowledge of wisdom. Knowledge of how to apply the scripture to our life. This is why the most important thing you can think of doing is reading your Bible. If you want to add moral excellence, you need to read God's word because you don't know how to live a moral life unless you know God's word. God's word is the instruction. It allows us to know when we're in that moment, what should we do? Should we turn our eyes to avoid it? Should we, should we, how should we use our money? How should I dress up? Should I, should I respond in a kind, gentle way? How should I deal? Should I call, call that person to repent of a sin? We need to know God's word. If we don't know it, we don't know how to respond. And so that's why I encourage people, read your Bible. And you don't need to read it all in a year. Some people put that pressure on themselves. Just read a chapter a day. Start in the book of Mark or Psalms. Start in something simple, but slowly read God's word and it will transform your mind. As we talked about uh, early in uh, 1 Corinthians, renew your mind. We transform your mind to the image of God. And we do that through God's word because it's the only way to know God's word and God's truth. And not only that, but we need to be in prayer, as I've been saying. You seek his word, you go to prayer, and then you need to come to church. You need to hear God's word preach. You need to hear the songs sing. We need to be in fellowship. We need to be in encouragement. We need to be in a, 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 a Bible studies or the prayer group because we need to be informed to know what God's desires for. What is God's will? And God's will is not some mysterious thing that we have to wait for. It's right here. All the questions of your life can be found answered here. So go to God's word and you'll have the knowledge to know how to live your life. Moving on, now verse six says this. And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, guidance. Now, the first word is that it should lead, that your knowledge of God should eventually lead to self-control. And I, I love this illustration I was reading about self-control. Actually, I might have been hearing it from Alistair Beck. I don't remember. But it, imagine self-control is like grabbing onto a rope for the, your hole. Imagine you're falling down from a cliff and you grab on that hole, rope with all your might. That's self-control. You're controlling your body so it won't move, so it won't be moved around is holding on tight to that rope so you won't fall down. It is idea that you're not going to be tossed to and from by the waves, but you're anchored on the rock of Christ, Christ Jesus. It means that you're not being uh, directed by just your whims of desires or emotions or the cultural pressure, that none of that tosses you to and fro, but your self-control, your self-control to God's word, your self-control that you don't let things uh, affect you to, to move you towards a sinful or ungodly way, you are self-control your life. And, and this is one that we all struggle with. Who in here struggles with self-control? If it's not everyone, uh, the, the, I have some repenting for you guys to do later on. We all struggle with self-control. And if you have a problem, if you really have a question with that, ask your wife and she'll remind you, yeah, you know, as my, um, Annette has reminded me, Jerry, you know, you kind of lost your self-control there. I mean, that, that wasn't too nice. We all could be better at being self-controlled. We could all be repentant of that and be more in control of our lives and allow Christ to help us have the ability to self-control. Because I know I struggle with that. Now, it's not when I was young. Man, when I was a teenager, teenage boys, not a pretty picture. Uh, we just do, you just do what you feel good. But as you grow, you mature. But we should have self-control because when we're not have self-control. When we allow the world to toss us to and fro, we'll end up going astray. The second one is not only just self-control, but self-control should lead to perseverance. This idea of perseverance, it means patience, 
steadfast, endurance, perseverance. And, and if I had a good image, you can imagine a lighthouse in a storm as a storm hits that lighthouse with all its might, with all its strength, it's pushing against it. And that lighthouse is perseverance. It stands firm and it's steadfast. It won't be moved. Or it reminds me of a soldier on the field where the enemy is coming toward him and he is going to hold his stand. He is with his fellow soldiers. They're going to hold this position no matter what happens. And that's the kind of perseverance we have. We are to be persevering in what God has called us to. That when the world tells us to jump, we don't jump. When God calls us to jump, that's when we jump. We allow God to control us and direct us. He is our uh, officer in command, and we will follow his commands. And if he tells us, stand firm, don't give in to the culture, my God, we're true, then we do that. And we stand firm with perseverance, knowing that God is sovereign in control. And this is one of the ones that right now, if you look in the church and we look at some Christians who are falling away, this is one they have lost on. Perseverance. When they were said, you, when they start being called, you're a bigot, you're intolerant, you're unloving. They said, well, I don't want to be called unloving. I don't want to be called bigot. So they just give in. They don't have perseverance. And if we are going to stand in this culture, you have to be perseverance against the world and be stands firm in God's word. The next one, perseverance should lead to godliness, which means reverence, respect. Some, word, some Bibles have is uh, piety towards God and how we live. is living a godly life. Or some would say a religious life. But it's living a, God, a life that says, I want to give praise to God. I like this. Um, Peter says, uh, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever then you eat or drink, where you do, do all to the glory of God. That's this living this godly, reverent life. Uh, having piety of life, of living your life for the glory of God, so that when you do your work, when you raise your kids, when we interact with the world, we say, ah, I'm doing this for the glory of God. You know, when, when Annette is at home and she's raising Joshua and she's doing the homeschooling, she's doing it for the glory of God. When you are helping your friends and neighbors, you do it to the glory of God. When you're at the store and you're shopping and you're interacting with the teller, do it for the glory of God. Think of any reaction that you have. It should all be done to the glory of God. And, and if, how you love your wife should be done to the glory of God. This is, this is what it means to have this godliness, this piety of life, that everything you think, how can I use my life to glory in this action and how I raise my kid and how I love my wife, how I go to work, how I take care of my elderly parents, how am I doing this in a godly, righteous way? And this is one that I think we, as a church, uh, especially some, uh, some churches, they struggle with it. They've lost the idea of godliness and Sometimes the idea of that God is this almighty God who's powerful and mighty that deserves all the war, glory and honor and praise. And sometimes we can approach God a little too flippantly. Sometimes we can preach God too much like a friend and not as our heavenly father, our sovereign, our creator, that we need to see our lives not to do what we want to do, which is a temptation. We want to do what we want. And then we say, okay, God, if you can work into my plans, God, that's great. Right? Don't we think that? Like, God, work in my plans. I have my plans. God, work with. But that's not the godly character that he wants to work on you. He wants to say, I want to transform you into what I want you to be. I want to make you a godly person, all your heirs. Let me work into your life, the life that I want you to create. And that is the type of godliness he's looking for. Then verse 7, real quick. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. The brotherly kindness is where we get this uh, word Philadelphia, town of brotherly love. 
and to understand that we are committed as brothers and sisters in Christ, that my church family is first and foremost in my mind as I, I sit down, after I pray for my family, I pray for my church family. That we are to love one another. And in fact, as First John would say, if we don't love one another, that we don't really love God. And so we are to have unique love and desire to help one another. And that's why I love getting together with the prayer group and praying with them. That's why I love coming alongside those who are struggling in their faith. We are to help those who are in need. We are to love them because they are our family. They are our new siblings. It's a new order. And so we should have this brotherly kindness or brotherly love. But that brotherly love should move on to the last one, which is love, which is this agape love. Now, these two are so close related, they're almost indistinguishable. But agape love, if we're just going to say it's this, it's often people call it the greatest love. But it's a love that we're called, where Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, and all of your neighbor, yourself. It is the chief thing. In fact, Paul would say in Corinthians that if you do not love, everything else is meaningless. That this is what we're hoping for. And so this is why love is on one side of the bookcase and faith is on the other hand. And they hold everything together. If you don't love, everything falls together. If you don't have faith, everything falls over. It's faith and love working together that helps to transform you into the image of Christ. With that, we'll close up because I'm already running, running a little behind. But this is the type of love that Christ wants to have in your life and may it transform you. And let me just finish off with this final say. May we defend our faith, because remember, this is how we're going to defend our faith, by being transformed into the image of Christ, being transformed into who God is from, through his power, through his changing our nature to transform us into the image of Christ and by that God's grace and power we will and by that we'll stand against the things of this world the things that will lead us astray let's close in prayer real quick and we'll finish dear heavenly father I thank you for this time I was if you like these videos please like share subscribe and ring that bell god bless you and have a good day